Okay, I'm grateful I didn't get stampeded while that was going on, but we are just happy to have uh, our children here and our workers with them, and so grateful to have uh, so many that are serving in the children's ministry area. I'm going to ask you this morning, if you would, go ahead and take your Bible and turn with me to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. I'm speaking to you today about living beyond ourselves. Living beyond ourselves. Now, uh, some of you are visiting with us or guests for maybe the first time today, and we're not here last week. Uh, others of you perhaps were on spring break or away. But I just want to say to you that what I'm doing uh, currently is we began last week a new series of messages, and the title of the series is No Matter What. No Matter What. And what we are doing in this series is we are going through the book of Philippians. Last week we looked at Philippians chapter 1. This week we're looking at Philippians chapter 2, and what we're doing as we go through the book of Philippians is that we are discovering how we can have joy no matter what. And so that's the series we're in right now. Now one of the things that I want you to see and understand as we go through God's Word together is that, are you ready for this? We have to fight for joy. If we are going to have joy, we have to fight for joy. Now, I want you to think about that for just a moment because in the past few weeks, we've been uh, dealt and are continuing to deal with the after effects of a tornado followed up by uh, the coronavirus that went from, you know, China to some cases that spread around the world. Now it's called a pandemic as it's on all seven continents. And you take on top of that the fact that uh, uh, we've been on a roller coaster ride with the stock market and uh, associated with these Events we're dealing with disruptions in our schools, disruption in our businesses, disruptions in our social lives. Um, we are undergoing some things that are unprecedented in our time, at least in recent years, as far as we know, for a very long time. Uh, the cancellation of sports on TV. And the cancellation of sporting events, I see some of you out there just say, what, they have sports on TV? Uh, you know, some of you may not know that or pay much attention to that, but when you cancel March Madness, if you think about all the advertising dollars, the, all the millions and millions of dollars that are put into that in that particular uh, series of events, one of the greatest sporting events that takes place every year, not only is that canceled, but the Masters Golf Tournament. And the last time, the only other time I believe that was canceled was in 1945 for the occasion of World War II. They canceled it in 1945. So here we're seeing some unprecedented things that are taking place. But uh, man, if you thought things were bad with the stock market, how about down at the supermarket? You can't even find toilet paper. Now, uh, uh, destruction displacement, emotional damage, uncertainty, a lengthy recovery, disease, death. I mean, do you want me to go on? Let me just say to you that all of these things, if we're listening, there's a message in all these things, and the message is clear. Everything in this world can be lost, stolen, or broken. 
And if we are going to find joy in this world, we're going to have to search for it somewhere other than this world. The joy that I'm talking about is a joy that is literally out of this world. Now Jesus possessed a joy that was beyond anything the world could offer. The very time in his life when he was facing a cruel death on Calvary, the scripture tells us in John 15 verse 11, Jesus says, I've told you these things, listen to this, he's headed to the cross, I've told you these things so that my joy may be in you and so that your joy may be complete. Christ says to his disciples as he is headed to the cross, he says to his disciples, my gift to you, my parting gift to you is I want you to have the joy that I have. Wait, what? What? You're going to die on a cross, and Jesus is talking about joy. That's a joy, folks, that's out of this world. You don't get that from things that are given in this world. That comes from someplace other than this world. Yet too often, you know what happens? We let circumstances, we let people, we let material things, and we let the worries of this world rob us of our joy. Right? Now, Paul's letter to the Philippian church is something of a thank you letter, but it's a whole lot more than that. It is the sharing of Paul's secret of Christian joy. Nineteen times in the book of Philippians. There are just four chapters in the book. It's short. You could read it in, you know, a few minutes. But in those four chapters... 19 times you'll read the words joy, rejoicing, and gladness. Now the interesting thing about that, Paul's writing about joy, gladness, and rejoicing. And yet when we think about the circumstances, when we think about the situation in which Paul found himself when he was writing this letter... There was nothing for him to rejoice about. Let me explain. When Paul wrote the book of Philippians, he was a prisoner in Rome. He was literally chained to a Roman guard under house arrest. And while he was under uh, uh, guard by these guards, three times a day, three different shifts, minimally three different shifts of soldiers would come. They would unshackle themselves from Paul and the next one would clamp the cuffs on himself and there he would be 24-7 chained to a Roman soldier. He's waiting a trial that is going to happen very soon and he doesn't know the outcome of the trial. He doesn't know if he's going to be acquitted or going to be executed. Now Paul writes to us about joy. In spite of the uncertainty, in spite of the discomfort, Paul overflowed with joy. What, Paul, is the secret to your joy? Because I want to get me some of that. Now last week in Philippians chapter 1, and not to re-preach the sermon, merely to refresh our memories. Last week in Philippians chapter 1, we learn that the secret of joy in spite of circumstances is knowing the difference between happiness and joy. There's a difference, you know. Happiness is external. If everything is going my way, I'm happy. And most of us have to admit we're a lot happier and easier to get along with when things are going our way, right? Happiness is external, but listen here, joy is internal. Happiness is based on circumstance, but joy is based on Christ. Happiness happens by chance. The very word happy comes from the Scandinavian word that means hap or chance. But joy... 
is a choice. Now, if we want to have joy, Philippians chapter 1, Paul says we need to take some action steps. Number one, stop asking why. And number two, start asking what. Stop asking why. Why is this happening to me? Why did this have to happen now? Why all of this? Stop asking those questions because you know what? There really aren't any answers for the why question. Now you can get some answers later on when you go and see the Lord. I've got a few questions myself. But there just aren't a lot of answers to why questions. Stop asking why and start asking what. The right questions are, God, what are you doing in this situation? What is it in my life that you are trying to refine and make over into the likeness of Jesus Christ that if I were not in this situation, I'd totally miss it? The right question is what? What is God trying to do in this situation? And Paul says in Philippians chapter 1, what really matters is that we focus on the things that matter to God. You know, we can focus on the things that really matter because you and I as believers in Christ are in, are you ready for this? A win-win situation. <laughs> Paul put it this way in Philippians chapter 1 verse 21. Let me explain to you our win-win situation. Paul says in Philippians 1 21, to live is Christ. That's a win. To die is gain. That's a win. What's Paul saying here? <laughs> if I live, if God wills that I live, then I can have joy in spite of my circumstances because I know God uses every situation to make me just like Jesus. And anything that happens in this life, any situation I'm in, I know God is using it for that great purpose. He's making me like Christ. It's a win for us because we also know that every situation is another opportunity to share Christ with others in that situation. That's a win. And if we die, we go to be with Jesus. I'd call that a win. Regardless of the situation, a Christian who embraces those truths has a joy the world cannot steal. Now in Philippians chapter 2, Paul shares... A second secret of joy. Christian joy is a result of living beyond ourselves. Instead of putting ourselves first and expecting others to serve us, the Christian puts others first and serves others, and the result is joy. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, look at it with me, would you please? Paul's a pastor. Paul founded this church in Philippi. Now, he's in Rome. He's writing a letter to him, but he's still a pastor. These were people who were a part of his congregation that he's writing to. And so Paul the pastor writes in Philippians chapter 2, verse 1. 
If then there is any encouragement in Christ, if any consolation of love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, uh, make my joy complete by thinking the same way, having the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Paul the pastor says to this congregation, look at it, my joy will be complete and your joy is complete. I will have done my job, what God called me to do, when your joy is complete. When you are walking in the encouragement of Christ and when you are walking in fellowship with the Spirit. My joy will be complete. Now look at what Paul says in verses 3 and 4 of chapter 2. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit. But in humility, consider others as more important than yourselves. Everyone should look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. This is a warning to us. Paul says, in big flashing lights, Christian, beware. There are some joy stealers. And what he says in these verses is he says this. He says, selfish ambition, conceit, pride, looking out for your own interests to the exclusion of others, these things will steal your joy. Now in 2013, the word of the year in America was selfie. Now what is a selfie? Well, let's see here. All right. Trying to define selfie here. And uh, turn that around. That puppy's got to be facing me. Um, a selfie is defined as a picture taken of oneself by oneself. Typically with a cell phone, using a stick or an extended arm, and is often taken high and or at an angle for the sake of effect. So, I, I, I see you back there trying to photobomb me in my selfie. So that's a selfie. Selfies are symptomatic of our society. In America today, there is a preoccupation with self. Folks, stop looking so spiritual. We need to confess to God, we're a nation of narcissists. Now, we might do a lot of things in the name of Jesus, but let me tell you what. It doesn't happen unless it first passes through me. And what I do for Jesus is after I do and take care of me, I get on to the other things. Am I right about it? Now, I'm the only one here who's willing to just kind of stand before everybody since God is watching and listening to this service. I mean, that's better than doing it live on Facebook, right? I mean, God is watching. He is listening. And I'm just here to say to you that, listen, we are narcissistic. Selfie. 
So in verses 3 and 4, Paul says, the way to keep selfish ambition, conceit, and self-absorption from stealing our joy is, look at it, is to live a life of humility, to consider others as more important than ourselves, and to look out for the interests of others. That's what he says. Now, Jesus possessed a joy that was beyond anything the world could offer. Therefore, what does Paul do? He calls our attention to look at Jesus. And in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11, look, this is what we read. Adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus, who existing in the form of God did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of humanity. And when he had come as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to death on a cross. For this reason, God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Folks, let me tell you something. Jesus is great because he humbled himself. When Jesus came to earth as a man, he did not cease being God. When Jesus came to earth, the creator of the universe became a humble servant for the sake, for our sake, and he came to this world to live as a man. As 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9 says so plainly. Though he was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor. And that's why the writer to the Hebrews said this in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. The writer to the Hebrews wrote this. Jesus is our example and we should chase hard after him. Let us run with endurance the race that lies before us, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the source and perfecter of our faith. For the joy that lay before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of God. Let me just explain something to you. It wasn't nails that held Jesus to the cross. It was joy that held Jesus to the cross. It was the joy of knowing I am doing God's will. And the result of me obeying and doing God's will is it will result in the salvation of many people. The key to joy is to develop a servant's heart. Now, if you want to just boil Philippians 2 down to one lesson. Here it is. The key to joy is a servant's heart. That's the view of Philippians chapter 2 from 30,000 feet. There it is. That's the principle. That's the whole purpose of the chapter. That's everything that chapter 2 has to say to us. And what happens in the rest of Philippians chapter 2 is that Paul takes a very creative approach to teach this principle. And so what he does is he shows us 
how this practically looks in our lives. And along the way, are you ready for this? He gives a couple of shout outs to two of his traveling companions. Living beyond ourselves is heart work. I didn't say hard work, although it is hard work. Living beyond ourselves is heart work. What is involved in this heart work? Now we're going to wrap it up. I'm just going to boil it down in three simple lessons that are taught in Philippians chapter 2. This is what it looks like practically in our lives. This is the heart work. Number one, go all in with God. Go all in with God. In Philippians 2 verses 12 and 13, the scriptures say, Therefore, my dear friends, just as you have always obeyed, so now, not only in my presence, but even more in my absence, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is working in you both to will and to work according to his good purpose. Now in the Greek language, the term work out is used by the first century author Strabo to speak of, the, of digging silver out of a silver mine. So, if we're digging silver out of a silver mine, we relate that to salvation, which is what he is talking about here. He says, work out your own salvation. What he's saying here is, he is saying that salvation can be compared to a huge gift. I mean, you ought to be at our house on uh, Christmas or over at my daughter's house on Christmas. Five boys, six, five, four, three, two. I mean, you might have taken, what, two, three minutes to wrap a present, put a bow on it? And I want to tell you what, they can undo that thing like this. I mean, there's paper flying everywhere. Do not get in the way. There are flying, there's paper flying everywhere. We have been given this great, big, awesome gift called salvation. And what Paul is saying is, Unwrap your gift so you can enjoy it. Paul is encouraging the Philippians to develop and work out their salvation, but not to work for their salvation. That'd be impossible since we're saved by grace, right? To work out our salvation, look at the next part of the phrase, with fear and trembling means to have proper respect. It means that God himself is at work in our lives and all that is done in our lives is done for his good pleasure. It pleases God to do good for us. But he can only bless obedience to his will. You follow me? I don't think anybody could say it any better than the hymn writer said when he penned the lyrics, trust and obey, trust and obey, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Hey, the first step of heart work if we are going to apply the principle of developing a servant's heart is go all in with God. Number two, take a genuine interest in others. In verses 19 to 22, Paul gives a shout out to Timothy. And he says in verses 19 to 21, Now I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you so that I too may be encouraged by news about you, for I have no one else like-minded 
who will genuinely care about your interests all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. Now, Timothy's name means literally one who honors God. He had accompanied Paul on his second missionary journey. And during that time of that second missionary journey, he was with Paul when Paul planted the church in Philippi. He was a co-worker in that ministry, sharing the gospel, praying with people, talking with them, helping them grow in their faith in Christ. Timothy was involved in all of that. And apparently, Timothy was well loved by the Philippians and he in turn had a great concern for them. Now in verse 30, uh, or rather, excuse me, in verse uh, 21, the phrase, all seek their own interest, is um, honestly an overstatement for emphasis. Most people tend to be selfish. That's true. But Paul knows Timothy's different. He's not like most people. He tells the Philippians that they too can break free from the selfish way of life if they have the mind of Christ. And that is the way Christ has laid out for us to do. You know what genuine concern, genuine interest is? Genuine interest is when we care for people with our actions like we say we care for them with our words. Ouch. Got nothing but love for you, brother. Genuine interest is when we care for people with our actions like we say we care with our words. Last thing, number three. Live a life of intentional relationships. In verses 25 to 30, Paul gives a shout out to Epaphroditus. Man, I've just been... Licking my chops, waiting to say that when Brother Bill, Epaphroditus. And he writes this. He says in verses 25 and 30, But I considered it necessary to send you Epaphroditus, my brother, co-worker, and fellow soldier, as well as your messenger and minister to my need. Therefore, welcome him in the Lord with great joy and hold people like him in honor because he claimed close to death for the work of Christ, risking his life to make up what was lacking in your ministry to me. Now, Epaphroditus was a Philippian Christian. He was from the church in Philippi. And he was sent by the church in Philippi to take a gift to Paul, who is a prisoner in Rome. And he was sent there to assist and encourage Paul. He's described with a series of complimentary terms. Brother. Proverbs says there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Do you have any friends like that? Do you have any friends that can call you in the middle of the night saying, I need help? And you'll drop everything, throw on your pants and go and help them however they need help? There's one of those words in there that I think is, they're all worth talking about, but 
for the sake of time as we wrap up. There's one phrase in there that I think is particularly telling. Paul refers to Epaphroditus as a fellow soldier. Did you know that the title fellow soldier was given only to those who had fought honorably alongside one another? Man, anybody here who thinks ministry is easy, come on, come get you some. When you have a fellow soldier, someone who's been in the fight, someone who's been tested and proven, they passed the test. We need people like that in our lives. We can't make it without them. There's one final verse I want you to consider this morning and then we're done. 1 Peter 5, 6 gives us a tremendous promise. It says this, Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God so that He may exalt you at the proper time. Do you see the promise? We humble ourselves and God exalts us. Uh, today, I, I want to ask you, have you humbled yourself before God? Have you admitted that you're a sinner and that you can't save yourself? Let me tell you something. There is nothing you can do to make God love you any more or any less than He already does. The Bible says God demonstrated His love for us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. When we were at our worst, God gave His best. He didn't say, hey, just clean up your act a little bit and then come. I want you to understand something today. God's not asking you to clean up your act. You don't have to have it all together to come to Him. In fact, He wants you to come just the way you are right now. He just wants you to say... Man, I am sick of what I am doing right now. I am just in a position right now where I am stuck and I am overwhelmed. And I ask you, Jesus, to save me from my sins. Would you do that today? Would you today humble yourself and bring yourself under God? And instead of continuing to focus on self-promotion, self-exaltation, self-serving, would you humble yourself as Jesus humbled himself? Because I want to tell you something. There's going to come a day when we are all, if we're believers in Jesus, true believers, we're all going to look Jesus eyeball to eyeball. And you know what? When that happens, it won't matter if somehow I was more humble than the guy down the street or my next door neighbor. That's not the measuring stick. The only thing that will matter is how do I measure up to Jesus? Is my life in line with his? So this morning as we go through the final stages of wrapping up our service, I want to say to you that you had a bulletin and you had a card Take that card. Just Everybody, would you just tear that off your bulletin right now, that card? Here's what I want you to do. If you want to follow Jesus as your Savior and Lord, we're not going to ask you to come forward this morning to talk to us, but what we would like for you to do is just, on there's our contact information. 
When you fill out that card, just say, I'm interested in knowing more about following Jesus as my Savior. Or just any note there, I need prayer. Would you pray for me about this? And put that in the offering when you leave this morning. Just let us know where you are right now spiritually and that you're interested in finding a church home. Did you do that today? Um, there's ways that we can reach out to you if you'll give us the contact information or our information on there. And you can email us or you can call us. Leave us a voicemail if you want to. We'll get back with you. Uh, we return all our calls and all our emails. I promise you that. Now this morning as we uh, prayed for at the start of the service, you came in this morning and you received a brochure. And that brochure said that uh, our theme this year for uh, North American missions is it's all about the gospel. And we are beginning seven, eight days of prayer, consecutive days of prayer. We prayed for day one in here this morning. And you may want to take that home and have a time of prayer, you know, more intentional about that. Personalize it a little bit. But each day this week, would you just take those prayer requests that are listed day one through eight and pray for one of those. We get together next Sunday. We'll continue praying that the Lord will reach North America for Christ. Listen, right now, with all the stuff that's going on right now, there are more people who are open and looking for answers that they have not found in the world than there ever have been. This is an unprecedented time. You know what I'm praying? God, just don't let us waste this opportunity. Now, nobody wanted this, nobody wished this, nobody signed up for this. But I'm telling you, God's at work in all of this in some mighty ways. I want us to watch this video right now as we pray this week for North American missions. It's baby food company... food company but the mom who created it says all the ingredients come from northwest arkansas Ace baby food company but the mom who created it says all the ingredients come from northwest arkansas farms i was working for a local television station as a broadcast news reporter and then i met dave <laughs> and her changed. whole world changed <laughs> Somebody invited me to Seattle just to learn about church planning for three days. Really instantly got gripped by this sense of lostness and darkness. Yeah, it's really just well known for a lot of new age, kind of Eastern religion. But if God's called us to this place, he's called us to plant our lives here. We did feel like God gave us a great affirmation and a sense of peace for mm -hmm. this particular spot for us to do his work. I just began going to a local park and I would meet moms and just talk. That really set the groundwork for building these relationships that became friendships. Mm -hmm. And then we began meeting in our home and then it grew. And then we made two groups yeah. and then that group. God really opened up doors at the community center. And so when we got there, we met in one little room in the community center and we took the doors, you know, the sliding doors and we met in two rooms. And then last fall, we moved to the gymnasium. Yeah, we have anywhere from 75 to 95 people on a Sunday morning. So it's exciting, We're, it's, it's thriving. When people give to missions, it may seem like this very generic offering, but it turns into very significant things that we can utilize to better help us do our ministry and our work here. I was a journalist, I was a news reporter, and, and those things defined me. God stripped all of that away, and so it taught me to find my identity in Christ. Because when we came up here, I, I didn't feel capable. You know, like Jesus and the fishermen, he was like, come on, I'm call you, be fishers of men. It's truth. Mm -hmm. And when we are able to just share that truth with people, it literally gives them hope.
Hey, church. My name is Wayne. It is good to worship with all of you this morning. Hey, I just wanted to take a brief second to stop. We are going to do something really special in this service. Um, before I do, I just want to comment on Pastor Sid's sermon. I am so thankful that God provided a sermon about joy in a time when our world has none of it. Um, I'm so thankful that we are defined by joy. In the first centuries, early Christians would sing hymns and psalms while being persecuted and tortured. We are defined by our joy in Christ. And so I'm so thankful that God provided that sermon for us this morning. So you might notice we're bringing up some stands here. I'm up here for a very special reason. I am up here because we today are going to unveil a new logo and a new website. And man, what the timing couldn't be better, I tell you. Um, so for today, here's the deal. We are going to be unveiling something very, very special. It's our new logo and new website. Now, when we do this kind of thing, sometimes it can feel like we're trying to do a makeover. Sometimes it could feel like we're trying to mask our history and mask all the things that uh, have happened in the past. But we can't really do that, right? We've been here for 174 years coming up this year. 174 years. Our church has a history that is amazing. Oh. And there's our logo. There we go. Hey, Jim, you can unveil the next one. <laughs> That's awesome. Okay, so while I'm here, we will talk about the logo. Um, I wanted to kind of prep you guys for it. That was sudden, but that's okay. So when we think about our church, we do not want to hide our history. We don't want to hide who we are. And I got to read over our history this past week, actually. I got to open up the book. You can unveil that, Jim. We're all good. Secret's out. Here we go. We had a drum roll prepared and everything for you guys. <laughs> so we wanted to do something that wouldn't hide that history. And here is the reason. Because our church has been around for so long. God has been faithful to us for that long. In 1846, when we first started meeting, guess how many times a month we met? One. This is not unusual, by the way. We only met one time a month. And God has been faithful through all that time. So we started thinking... How did the founders of this church consider what would happen here? What did they want to do? Well, we can look at the name for one. Our name is New Hope. What does that refer to? Does that refer to a sunrise coming up in the morning? Does that refer to the freshness of spring? No. New Hope refers to a person. It refers to Christ our King. New Hope refers to Christ who transforms lives. Christ who changes everything. That arrow we have built into our logo is because everyone can find new hope in Christ. Everyone can move forward. The sinners can be saved. The saved can be sanctified. The sanctified will be glorified. We are always moving forward in Christ. There is no such thing, and there should be no such thing, as a static saint. So, I am going to go ahead and unveil our logo. There it is. Good. Okay, so a couple things. You're probably wondering, is the blue part of us? No, that blue is just blank space. It's actually only this white space in those letters. Another cool thing is, what is our church doing? We are on the disciples' path. We are always moving forward. If you follow with your finger, if you look, it is one solid line that is representing the disciples' path. We are new hope, we're moving forward, and we're on this one single path together. So a lot of prayer and a lot of time and a lot of effort went into this. Our staff and several volunteers, we were really, really excited about this. We wanted this to reflect the history of the church. It's simple for a reason, too. We can take this, and guess what? We could put this on t-shirts and make bumper stickers and do all sorts of easy branding, and it won't be very costly. Here's the deal. This reflects our history, and we hope that as a church you would get excited about this. And along with this, and this is going to be a lot more smooth, we are going to unveil to you now our website. David, you can play that. It's baby food company, but the mom who created it says Not all the ingredients. There we go.
Wow, that's awesome. Really incredible. And um, uh, can I just say it's done by all volunteers. So um, most churches have paid staff and personnel to do that, but uh, we're getting this going with a volunteer army and uh, see where God will take us as we go down this road together. And you can see we're off to a pretty phenomenal start, right? And uh, it's been a long time in the coming. I just want to say thank you to all those of you who have worked on it. And as exciting and as lighthearted as some of the moments here at the end have been, um, I, I wanted to share with you, you saw uh, one of our ladies come up and share with me a prayer request uh, that she felt needed to be prayed for today. She is a school nurse and just received a call that one of her fifth graders has coronavirus and she's been called to go and uh, take care, check on that family. So, uh, wash your hands. Last night, I'm over, uh, yesterday afternoon, I'm visiting my granddaughter and I'm standing at the sink. I just walk in, take my shoes off. My son says, go wash your hands. I say, well, I'm, you know, I, you don't have a door next to the sink, so I've got to walk across the room to get over there, but that's where I'm heading. And I get over there, and my wife's washing her hands, and she's singing happy birthday to you. Y'all know what that's about? <laughs> they say you're supposed to sing all the way through the happy birthday song twice while you're washing your hands for it to be effective or most effective. So everything in this building was completely wiped down, and I mean sterilized with the right mixture of the, what's it called, Brian? Yeah, but there's a certain, there's a certain mixture of Clorox and water. If you, get it too, if you get it too much, you're dead, and if you don't get enough, it won't kill anything. And so we use just the right mixture, and uh, Mary Bell and Matt have, uh, you know, been on top of this and done so much to help and get us ready to be able to have this service today. Um, follow the usual CDC guidelines. This is a fluid situation. We are in the same uh, boat that everyone else is. Uh, we are claiming 1 Timothy uh, 1.7, which says God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power, love, and of sound judgment. But I want to say to you also that we are good Christian citizens. Are you hearing me? And as good Christian citizens, we need to follow what the authorities tell us we should do. And no doubt some of you are here maybe because your church dismissed services. There are certain numbers of people that qualify, at least now, what they're qualifying as a mass gathering. And the greater the number of the people, the greater the risk. What we are trying to do is we are trying to minimize the spread of the disease on the front end right now so that we can stay on a certain low-end curve. Because when it expands and reaches a certain point, we can't keep up with it. So I want you to know that there's two sides to 2 Timothy 1.7. One, one is, we don't have fear. Our trust is in God. But he's also given us sound judgment. And we also want to be good Christian citizens, right? Can I get an amen? Wouldn't we like for the government to say, hey, those Christians, they're good law-abiding citizens. They go along with the program. They don't say, man, we're too good for that stuff. You, you, you with me? So, it's a fluid situation. We have no idea what the next news broadcast will bring or what advice we will receive, but we'll stay in step and stay in touch with you, and uh, we thank you so much. Today, as you leave, we're collecting our... We're not passing the offering buckets. We're collecting the offering at the door. You can also, as you saw, you can give online. Yeah? And... Uh, doesn't cost anything to do it. 
So you set up and you give online, and it's great for us to be able to uh, offer that service to you. And uh, by the way, you know, the church will just go right on. So uh, God's people are faithful and good, and we count on you continuing to be faithful and generous in your giving.